Brajanath asked the question, Prabhu, I understand that this marginal position, they're talking about the jiva, that means us, as, oh, well, let's go back a little, a little further. There are also innumerable atomic conscious jivas who emanate from Karana Dakshai Mahavishnu's glance upon his Maya Shakti. Since these jivas are situated next to Maya, they perceive her wonderful workings. Although they have all the qualities of the jivas that I have already described, they are very weak because of their minute and marginal nature. Sometimes they become inclined to look to the spiritual world and sometimes to the material world. In this marginal condition, the jiva becomes debilitated because at that time he has no spiritual strength from his worship, worshipable Lord's mercy. Among these unlimited jivas, those who want to enjoy maya become engrossed in mundane sense gratification and enter the state of eternal bondage. On the other hand, the jivas performing chid anushilanam or bhag- of Bhagavan receive spiritual shakti, chid bala, by his mercy and enter the spiritual world. Baba, it is our great misfortune that we have forgotten our service to Krishna and have become bound in the shackles of Maya. Only because we have forgotten our constitutional position are we in this deplorable condition. So, Babaji Maharaj is explaining this big mistake we made. I, I, we probably all have this experience. We, make, we do something stupid and the consequences haunt us for days, weeks, years, or your whole life. Like if you marry the wrong person, right? That consequence haunts you the rest of your life. Ha, ha, ha. Now, if you're driving somewhere and you take a wrong turn, sometimes you get on the wrong road and you go off and it takes you a long time to get back. Or, I mean, there's so many examples that we can think of. You know, you've got the wrong job, you moved to the wrong city, you got the wrong apartment. So similarly, this was a huge, major wrong decision that we all made. And so what he's explaining is that we are, we are tatasta. Tatasta means marginal. There are certain living entities that are eternal associates of Krishna. They do not fall. But other living entities have the independence to choose. And so what he's saying is we made a very bad choice at one time. The interesting thing is that although we made that bad choice, we continue making that bad choice because we learn from Shastra, it says that at one point we turned our back on Krishna when you, Prabhupada said, Krishna's, Maya's right on the back side of Krishna, so as soon as you, it's like the one side of your hand and the other, and as soon as you, you turn your hand over, then Maya's there on the other side. So, we turned our back on Krishna, there is Maya. The problem is, that scenario tends to continue in material existence when we have the opportunity to turn to Krishna because we're Tatasta and because we know about Krishna now, that means we also have the opportunity to turn away. If you don't know about Krishna, you really, I mean, although you have the chance or the opportunity to turn to Krishna, you really don't because you really don't know how or who he is. But once you learn about bhakti, then you have the opportunity to turn to Krishna. So in this sense... At every moment, it's a choice, Krishna or not Krishna, Krishna or Maya. So we're, we're, it's like we made this hugely 
bad decision, but we continually make that bad decision. We continually try to imitate Krishna. Same thing as turning away. That's what we do. So, I just wanted to make us realize it was a very bad decision and make us realize that we are, we are continually making those decisions. Every time we think about or see something or think of it in, as separate from Krishna, then we're making that decision. So let's read on. Bhajana says, Prabhu, I understand that this marginal position is at the junction of the spiritual and material worlds. So now he asks a very good question, which you have probably asked. And it, this question has probably been asked to many of you. Why is it that some jivas go from there to the material world while others go to the spiritual world? In other words, why did some choose to come to the material world and others not? Or why did... He's, he's explaining here that there was a choice made to come to this world. Others chose not to. So why? So Babaji explains, Krishna's qualities are also present in the jivas, but only in a minute quantity. Krishna is supremely independent, so the desire to be independent is eternally present in the jivas as well. When the jiva uses his independence correctly, he remains disposed towards Krishna. But when he misuses it, he becomes opposed to him. It is just like this opposition, it is just this opposition that gives rise to the desire in the jiva's heart to enjoy maya. Because of the desire to enjoy maya, he develops the false ego that he can enjoy material sense gratification, and then the five types of ignorance. In other words, we use this word false ego a lot, and we also, in, commonly in the English language, we say someone has a big ego. And what we mean by that is a, he thinks a lot about himself, a lot more about himself than everybody else does. So there's a joke. It's time for a joke. There was a man in South America, he called his friend. He said, I'm going to make a lot of money. He said, how? He said, well, I, I've just bought this man who's going to work for me, and I bought him for what he's worth. And I'm going to fly him down here, and then I'm going to sell him for what he thinks he's worth. You can laugh, everyone. That was a good joke. So... What are we worth and what do we think we we're worth? So that's generally, you know, when we say he's got a big ego, we, we say he's proud, which is true. But here, another definition or the more correct or the more fundamental definition is given, that the false ego simply means that I can enjoy independently of Krishna, that, that, that my constitutional position is enjoyer when actually it's not. So when we say false ego, it simply means, I think, I identify as one who can enjoy rather than identifying as one who serves. Very simple. We all know this, but actually we don't know it. And what I find quite interesting in Krishna consciousness is that we learn a lot of things practically in the very beginning, which we kind of think we understand because it gets us to practice devotional service, but the more you practice devotional service, you realize a lot of these simple things you really haven't understood. I mean, how many of us really understood that what false ego means is to think that I can enjoy, like Krishna? We don't normally think that way. We understand it, but that's what false ego means. That's false identity. False identity is I'm enjoyer. Real identity is I'm servant. A, B, A, B, C's of bhakti. So, let's read on. It is just this opposition. Opposition means he's turning his back on Krishna. It, that gives rise to the jiva's heart to enjoy maya. So, 
we turn our turning our back on Krishna and the desire to enjoy Maya, they go together. They don't happen separately. It's it's just simultaneously. It's one thing is the other thing. To to want to enjoy independently of Krishna, you have to turn your back on him because if he's there, it causes a problem. Because if he's there as the enjoyer, how can you put yourself as the enjoyer? It doesn't work. So if you can just get him out of the picture, then you can fully go ahead and enjoy. So sometimes you might be in a situation um, and your enjoyment is being hampered by somebody. So if you can just get rid of that somebody, then you can enjoy fully. So this is theoretically, it's an analogy. So similarly, to enjoy fully maya, we have to get Krishna out of the picture. Or... We first get Krishna out of the picture so we can enjoy it. It, just, it doesn't matter how you look at it. It's just that's what's happening. And so if you'll notice in your own life, when you're thinking about material enjoyment, unless you're a demigod or extremely pious, you generally don't think of Krishna, especially if the enjoyment is sinful. Then how can you think of Krishna? The demigods, they can enjoy sense gratification without forgetting Krishna. They somehow or other they can do that. But for us on this planet, only only the very pious people think about enjoying sense gratification and bringing God into it. But they'll only enjoy, but they'll do pious activities to get material enjoyment. They won't be sinful. But when you when it comes down to very sinful activities, you notice in your own life that you kind of consciously, subconsciously, you have to move Krishna out of this, this, the equation because he doesn't really fit in very well. Right? And so, in devotional service and bhakti, we're always trying to bring Krishna into the equation. And as we know, when we bring him into the equation, the more we bring him in, the more self-controlled we naturally become, or the more we think ourselves as a servant, or the more we see things, as I explained last week, the more we see things in relation to Krishna. Um, So Leela Krishna says, "Um, well, in work, we're always away from Krishna. Does it mean that we are in Maya? Then how do we dovetail? (laughs) Well, it's an interesting question, because... If you're a devotee and you're working, the result of your work is to maintain your devotional service and to maintain your family so they can do their devotional service. So your work then becomes connected to Krishna. So your work is bhakti. But it doesn't mean that you're conscious of that when you do it. So it just means it's a more neophyte situation. that You've connected it, but you're not conscious of it. Just like you're chanting Hare Krishna, and you may not be conscious you're chanting Hare Krishna. So you're connected to Krishna and chanting, but you're not even thinking of Krishna. So that's more of a neophyte stage. And so you can be at work and be distracted by maya, even though your work is for Krishna. So... You know, bhakti has it has two aspects. One's your body, and one's your heart. And the heart is more important than the body. What you know, what we do, and how we do it is one aspect of bhakti, but it's not as important as the consciousness with which we do it. And that's the most difficult part. And I think that's the part where many devotees kind of give up on, because it's so difficult. It's easier to be engaged. It's more difficult to engage your mind. I don't know if you're aware of it. If you do deity worship, one aspect of deity worship is that you, in your mind, you do the puja before you actually do it. And that's to bring your mind into the present so that your mind is focused on what you're doing because it's very easy to do something, especially if you do it every day, but your mind's not doing it. Your mind's not there. And so... So we, we find this with japa, that you could be chanting, but your mind's not there. So your body's doing it, but your subtle body's not doing it. And, and the more you understand about bhakti, the more you understand that it's the mood in which you do something 
that's more important. And and the highest stage of bhakti is samadhi. And in samadhi, what does samadhi mean? Sama means equal and di means consciousness. Samadhi means you're always thinking of Krishna. So you study Krishna consciousness, you'll see that in each stage, level you advance, you're thinking of Krishna more. So it's a very, very immature situation to be engaged in devotional service but kind of be still in the enjoyer bhav, the enjoyer mood. Okay, my body is engaged, but I'm trying to enjoy what I'm doing. Instead of using that service in the mood of a servant of Krishna, and then whenever enjoyment comes as a result by being in the mood of enjoyed, that, that's Krishna's gift to me, but it's not, that is not sense gratification. Whereas I'm trying to enjoy the service, then, then it becomes like the service is just, almost an excuse for my material enjoyment. But really the service is supposed to be a means to express your devotion, not a means to rationalize sense gratification. So, and you're saying, you know, how to dovetail maya. Well, you've already dovetailed it because you're, because the result of your work, hopefully, is not um, to spend all your money going to Disneyland. Maybe it is, I don't know. But hopefully most of your money as either going to support your family who are devotees or to spread Krishna consciousness in some way. So that the real challenge is what to do with your mind and, and what to do with your senses, because your senses can be engaged physically in serving Krishna, but um, they can be also trying to enjoy simultaneously. I mean, it's, I mean we, are, we are very programmed to want to enjoy the senses. So even while in, you know, like I could be giving a lecture right now. I mean, not that I could be, I am. And so let's say, right now I'm speaking, but what I'm thinking is, I'm just trying to impress everybody because I really want people to think I'm special. And I really want to get people to honor me and I really, I'm really, i hoping that after this class you'll all send me emails and tell me how wonderful I am. Of course, I'm trying to simultaneously do some service to Prabhupada and service to you by helping you, but that also could be a very strong motivation. And that motivation is, is, an as, is a very strong aspect of material conditioning. And a very high level of material enjoyment is to be honored. So if, while I'm speaking, I've connected what I'm speaking to Krishna, it's, it is not even connected, it's directly Krishna, I don't even have to connect it. But I'm also motivated or trying to enjoy the position of a teacher who's honored. Because it makes me feel good if I'm honored. So that would be an example, that I'm engaged in devotional service, but... There's, I'm trying to enjoy the service. So it's kind of like devotional service in the mode of passion, that, that I'm, I'm serving Krishna, but I'm trying to enjoy. I'm still in that enjoyer mood. You see, that? that's the whole problem. And if you understand bhakti, we always talk about bhakti, right? You should serve Krishna with devotion, because, because that's the essence. I mean, if you, if you, as I said before, if you just, the more you study the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, the more you'll see it just boils down to the essence is devotion. Right? And so then, then you see that the mentality to enjoy is really diametrically opposed to the mentality of enjoyer. And that's why, that's why if we're in this false ego, Bhav, that I'm enjoyer, then the best we can do is dovetail our propensity to enjoy in Krishna's service, you know, karma yoga. It's, you know, it's better than nothing, but we're trying to come to a higher level, which is not to dovetail sense gratification, but it is to completely purify the desire to enjoy. So Sushma says, you mean it's wrong to enjoy chanting? It's the best part of the day for most devotees. It depends how you're enjoying it. If you're in the mood of pleasing Krishna and you enjoy it, that's called ruchi. That's a spiritual enjoyment. If you're in the mood um, that I'm meant to enjoy, be the enjoyer of the holy name, then that's maya. 
It all depends on your consciousness. And that enjoyment you get from chanting, if you're in the mood of enjoyer of Krishna, it won't purify you. It will keep you in the material world, even if, even if you think it make, it's making you happy. But generally that's not so much of a problem for devotees. It's, it's more a problem when you first become a devotee. Like, at least I don't even know if it was a problem for you, Sushma, but for us in the West, we come to Krishna consciousness and we chant Hare Krishna totally in the mood to enjoy the chanting, not in the mood of servant. We don't even know we're servant. No one told us yet. We find that out later, but initially we're coming to enjoy it. So, Krishna is so kind, he's in his name, so some spiritual enjoyment comes through it. And that spiritual enjoyment starts to disintegrate the desire to enjoy the holy name. And then eventually we realize that the real enjoyment is just to serve the holy name, become servant of the name. And we serve the name by chanting in the mood of Krishna, please engage me in your service, and also giving the name to other people. So, is it wrong to enjoy the desire Wrong to enjoy and desire love from Krishna, especially if you give your heart to him. No, it's not as long as you're in the mood of servant. Um, more, I think more, the proper consciousness for us now is to be more open to Krishna's mercy. That Krishna, please show me your mercy so that I can love you. I mean, really... The understanding is if you love Krishna, then he reciprocates ten times. So how do you get Krishna's love? You give it. You give your own love. Um, so desiring love from Krishna, just reverse the equation. Desire, I, I would say, he's already, look at it this way, he's already giving you love through his words, through his devotees, through Iskand, through Prabhupada, through so many ways. So appreciating that yes appreciate it and then desire rather than say enjoy I would say appreciating because you always want to be in the mood of enjoyed you want to be enjoyed by Krishna that's that's our position not your position it's all of our position to be enjoyed by Krishna so we want to be in that mood when we're chanting that Krishna um, I'm just your servant please help me please help me I'd like to please you so that I'm enjoyable to you, so that I can satisfy you. And see, that way, that's how you enjoy. And, and see, the whole point is that when enjoyment comes to you, it comes as a byproduct of not wanting to enjoy. That's how, that's how it comes. And that's how you know it's ruchi, it's, it's spiritual. But if you're trying to enjoy devotional service, then it could be very mixed with your just own desire your own ability to in, enjoy particular activity. Okay, an activity may be enjoyable for you, but ultimately, if it's material, it's not going to be enjoyable. It'll only be temporary, temporarily enjoyable. But if that activity which you enjoy is used in Krishna service, it'll become supremely enjoyable if you are in the mood that this, this is for Krishna. You're just like, I enjoy doing something. So that's fine. As long as I do that in the mood of service to Krishna for his enjoyment. We talked about this last week, talking about playing music. Okay, you like to play music, but do it to satisfy Krishna or do it in a way that will help people become Krishna conscious. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the whole thing we're talking about and, and uh, about being in the bhava of enjoyed. I'm enjoyed by Krishna. So enjoy, spiritual enjoyment is no problem. As long as Krishna is giving it to you, take it. It's his mercy. But if you're trying to squeeze it out from, from the platform of I'm enjoyer, so I should enjoy God, then it's wrong. You, re, you read in the Bhagavatam about how the gopis are enjoying Krishna's kissing and all this, but if we take it from our subjective position, they were thinking, we're thinking of it in a mundane way. But their whole mood is not enjoying Krishna. Their whole mood is serving Krishna. But Krishna is Ananda Maya. He's full of bliss. So you can't come in contact with Krishna in a pure state, in a, a, not even a pure state, but motivated purely, and then not experience bliss. 
right? Because Krishna is blissful. So, um, we use this word a lot, nectar. Oh, that was nectar. So what does that mean? It, it means that for us to experience nectar, or what they say in New York, nectar. For us to experience nectar, nectar, we can't be in the enjoying spirit. It's the whole, it's the whole paradox. It's when you're in the spirit of service, then you say, oh, that class was nectar, that kirtan was nectar, that prasadam was nectar, this was nectar. And it's because you're not in the mood of purusha, you're in the mood of prakriti, you enjoy it. So, and now you're actually in a, you're, you're in a position where you can enjoy the purity of Krishna consciousness because Krishna is enjoyable. He's sweet, right? There's so many verses. There's so many verses about Krishna, right? Sweet, madhu, madhuram, 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 the sweet holy name, the, the sweetness of his smile, the nectar of his lips, all these things. So, so who is appreciating that? It's only people who are pure appreciating that. So this brings up this whole dichotomy of we're trying to enjoy. We have this Purusha Bhav, we're trying to enjoy. I want to enjoy. I mean, how do we enjoy? We enjoy our senses. I mean, that's, what do we have to enjoy? We have a body. And the body has senses. So what's enjoyable about life is the senses, also the mind. You can enjoy Emotions, you know, feelings, experiences. I see you, you see me, we're happy to see one another. We don't have to even touch, we just see one another. And we're touching through the eyes and then so much emotion comes. So it's, it's through these senses where we get all our experience, right? And so the, the dichotomy is, or the paradox, is that we are wired to enjoy the senses. And the more we try to enjoy them, the more we remove ourselves from our ability to enjoy spiritual bliss. So it's just, it's this huge trap. And if you'll notice in your life, just, you know, you notice this propensity to enjoy. It's, it's the two propensities that we, we come here with, enjoy, to enjoy and to control. And you just notice how much we are Condition to always think about our enjoyment, and that's why, that's why we we always always emphasize this idea: serve the devotees, serve the Vaishnavas. And then we have, and then we have like so many reasons why we shouldn't. Yeah, but this devotee, you know, he talks prajapa, and this one, you know, he he wears dirty socks, and this one, he's not very smart, and this one, he's, he doesn't smile at me, and. You know, great, so all right, don't serve them. You know, just go serve yourself. What are you going to do? See, the whole point is we want, to, we want to manifest our position as servant. We don't want reasons why we can't be servant. And we don't, certainly don't want to manifest putting ourselves in a position where we'll be served, which is what we want, really, when it comes down to it. And, and so that's the whole problem that we're dealing with and so we just have to notice that in our life how that tendency it, it's always there and and if you look at your problem I mean, if you ever have a problem this one devotee wrote me um, that he separated from his girlfriend I don't know how long it sounds like it's been a while but he was he was kind of lamenting over it reflecting on New Year's Day and you know he wasn't with her and She's actually, she's actually getting married to someone else. I hope it's not his best friend. That makes it really difficult. But you know, he was asking for some guidance, and I was saying, you know, just look at look at the situation. Say, we're always thinking about: Am I happy or am I not happy? It's like we carry a meter, a happiness meter, inside of us. And if the happiness meter doesn't at least go over six, we just go into the state of depression. Oh, I'm unhappy, I'm unhappy. From the Krishna conscious point of view, or I would say the higher, Krishna, highest Krishna consciousness point of view, it doesn't matter if you're happy. <laughs> it really doesn't. I mean, in a practical sense, it matters that we're happy in Krishna consciousness because if we're not happy in Krishna consciousness, we're going to go running after Maya. So in that sense, we should find happiness and satisfaction in Krishna consciousness. In that sense, it's important. But I'm talking of it in another sense. In another sense, that we're always we're like monitoring myself. 
Am I happy? Am I not happy? Will this make me happy? Will this not make me happy? Oh no, my girlfriend left. Oh, what do I do now? I'm not happy. So I told him, I said, it's really important for you to think about what you can do to please Krishna. Because right now, you, who are you thinking about? You're thinking about the person who's not happy all the time. And you think, I'm not happy, I'm depressed, I'm upset. And, and I was trying to communicate to him. I said, wait a minute, stop thinking about yourself. You, you know something very interesting that sometimes we get, we get mixed up with what humility is. And, and we try to become humble and being humble is extremely difficult, especially when you haven't practiced it for like 10 million lifetimes. It gets really difficult. When you, and when you start trying to do it, it's like you're looking for something. You ever look for something? You have no idea where it is, and you're looking at all your shelves and your drawers, and you just can't. So you know, trying to become humble is that you're trying to figure out, how do you become humble? What is it? It's like looking for something... You know, if you've lost it for 10 billion lifetimes, and you're like, where did I put that? It's like, we don't even know where to start looking or what it is. It's very, very difficult. And so, sometimes what happens to devotees, we, we get kind of confused. There's actually going to be an article coming out about this um, in BTG in India, which I've written. And it's one of my newsletters about this idea of um, feeling unworthy or feeling lowly. And how that's a transcendental emotion, but it's also uh, an emotion of a mentally sick person. So sometimes we manifest the mentally sick part, which is, I'm so bad, I'm so this, I'm so that. And, and you look at Bhaktivinoda Thakur and he's saying, I'm so bad, I'm so this, I'm so that. But he's not psychotic, neurotic, manic, depressive. He's a lover of Krishna, and he's just reflecting. Look at me, I, you know. For one second today, I thought about my personal enjoyment. I'm so bad, I'm so useless, because that was one second that I could have used for Krishna, but I didn't. Oh, Krishna, please, please give me your mercy. I just want to think of you 24 hours a day. I don't want to forget you for a second. That's how he thinks. So what is he thinking about when he thinks I'm so this and that? He's thinking about Krishna. And what are we thinking about when we're thinking I'm so this or that? We're thinking about ourselves. I'm so this, I'm so that, I'm so depressed, I'm so... You see the difference? So, um, it's all about us. And so we're, we're trying to get away from that. So even when we try to become humble, we end up it's like then we end up in some weird state where we want everyone to feel bad about us, bad for us. So we still stay in the center. Then we get enjoyment from feeling miserable if everybody around us feels miserable that we're miserable and oh, this poor thing. And you see, though, it's just it's just an endless loop of putting ourselves in the center. So now, Holy K under the code name of N Zin. Nimzu. Did I say that right? Ens Nimuz Ens Nimzu. She's on a secret mission, folks. We can't know her real identity. She's asking. In Nimzu. Oh, okay. In Nimzu. So those of us who truly love Krishna can feel shame when they mess up. It you feel more remorse. I mean, it depends how you define shame. You feel end, ends, nims, ends, nimsu. It, de it depends. You see, there's transcendental shame and there's shame in the mode of ignorance. So how do you know the difference? Well, you know the difference by where you end up. I mean... You know, a lot of times the Bodhi says, well, how do I know that I'm doing this purely? And how do I know I'm chanting purely? And how do I know my chanting, I'm, this enjoyment I'm getting is not sense gratification? And ultimately, the answer for how do you know is, look at your life. Look at your bhakti. Look at your heart. Look at the symptoms. Then you know. You know, if you're, if you're how do I know I'm chanting purely? Because... You're getting inspired in devotional service. You're becoming detached. It's manifesting in your actions. It's manifesting in your consciousness. That's always the answer to how do I know. 
How do I know I'm doing good in school? Look at your grades. Look at what you know. Could you teach what you just learned? Do you understand it? If you can explain it to someone else, you must be doing okay because you understand it. If you got all A's on your report card, you must be doing good. It's like asking, how do I know I'm healthy? Because you just know, because you've got energy. Your mind works. Your body doesn't hurt. So, like that. Um, So I get the feeling of wronging a loved one when I mess up. Yeah, so that's remorse. Um, and But the whole point is, if it's remorse, then it's, remorse means you rectify it, you learn from it. And, and so we're works in progress, so that's fine. On a higher stage of bhakti, one may think everything they do is is not good, because they're looking at it from such a high stage of purity. They're looking at it. You know, we're just... We're looking at it, well, if I make it through today, you know, following the regular principles, it was a good day. They're not looking at it from that platform. So their expression of emotion is from the platform of love. So our expression is, is different. You know, if I, if I don't think I'm an enjoyer for five minutes, wow, that was a good day. If they think they're an enjoyer for one second, that was a bad day. So, we, you know, we have to be kind upon ourselves and we have to adjust our consciousness accordingly. So... Um, it's it's good, it's good if we think when we're thinking of personal enjoyment. It's good if we think, oh Krishna, just see, I'm such a rascal. Instead of thinking about pleasing you, I'm thinking about pleasing my senses. It's good if we think that way because that's the problem. That's what we're dealing with, right? Anyway, I mean. I could make this point a hundred times and we and it's still very difficult to get because we're conditioned to think this way. Isn't it? You agree? It's not easy to get. Um, so the whole idea of Krishna consciousness is, okay, um, <laughs> not to daydream in Maya. <laughs> daydreaming is, is just because we're not satisfied. You know, think of it like this. You know, every plan, uh, I says, um, I'd like to have money and live here and have a new car and bikini, babes, etc. Okay. All right, so think like that. I mean, don't think like that. Think like that in theory. So now let's look at that. Okay, now, no plan that anybody makes ever works out the way they made it. And even if it does work out kind of the way they made it, the experience never works out the way they intended it to be. So you get something, and then you say, oh, is this all it is? Isn't there anything more to it? I thought it was going to be better. You know. So you finally make it. You become famous. Holy K is now famous. And she's on stage, and 100,000 people are jumping up and down screaming. You know. And after she does her performance, she goes back to the stage and she goes, I feel so alone on top here. And she just shoots up some heroin to deal with it. Right? Is that what happens? Of course it happens, right? Or she gets married and, you know, everybody wants to marry her now and, you know, and all these guys are just after her. And then they, one of them gets her pregnant and leaves her. I mean, okay, it doesn't, it's the, you know, it either doesn't work out the way you want it or the experience um, No, it's a good question um, the, it, it either, You know, we make all these plans but the plans, they don't work out that way and How often does it work out that way? You know, I plan to go here and do this and do that but then, you know, I had to work two jobs because, you know, the stock market crashed and blah, 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 blah or I actually did what I wanted, but the experience of it was not at all what I thought it was going to be. And um, that can be a cause of misery. So, not can be, it is. So, we have to be intelligent. We have to be intelligent enough to look at a situation and say, no, Krishna's not in that. I have to make plans around Krishna, what he wants, instead of making plans about what I want. Okay. You want all these nice things. That's not such a bad thing. Well, the bikini thing, babes, that's a bad thing. But the house, the money, and the car, that's okay. 
you just have to be in the mood of enjoy, that you can use those for Krishna. Of, you know, all right, so you have a nice house, so have nice programs in your nice house and impress nice people or impress people who are impressed by nice things, that you have a nice house and you chant Hare Krishna and you, you can also have a nice house if you chant Hare Krishna. You, know, you can use it all in Krishna's service. That's the, the problem is not the nice house or the nice car. The bikini babes, that could be a problem. Well, you can have one of them if you marry her. Uh, I'll tell you something funny. Um, not funny, but true. Um, okay, I'll answer your question first. Would it hamper you if you desired something to help you in Krishna consciousness? No, not at all. Close for a deity, maybe modest clothes, men aren't s- staring, yeah, at my... Yeah. Um, you notice the men stare at your... So, um, these guys are really bad, I tell you. Ladies, watch out for them. They're dangerous. So, yes. Now, Bhakti Purana Maharaj Swami said something very interesting. You know that if you want to worship the deity, you have to take brahminical initiation before you can touch the deity. And he said, similarly, before you can, the man can touch a woman, he has to go through a ceremony. It's called marriage. Interesting, isn't it? If you look at marriage, marriage, I mean, you know, what, what is greater than, than the desire to enjoy the opposite sex? But how does it work in, in, a, in a spiritual way? Or even in a dharmic way? It's, it's done in a way that that propensity to enjoy won't ruin your life. You see? So we have this propensity to enjoy, but you see everything in Krishna consciousness deals with that propensity, so gradually it's minimized and it can be dovetailed and used in Krishna's service. Um, In your home, no, but to install that deity and worship it as an installed deity, yeah, you would have to be initiated. Otherwise, you offer your food to your deity of Krishna, that's fine. Um... And hamper you if you desired something to help you in Krishna consciousness. No. Anything that helps you in Krishna consciousness, you can desire that. You just have to know what's going to help you. Sometimes you may not know and may think you know. That's another thing. Okay. Good question. It all evolves around this. I'm not the enjoyer. I'm the enjoyed. I'm the servant. And write that... Your assignment for today is write that down 108 times when you get up in the morning, every day for the rest of your life. Actually, chanting of the Baha Mantra is just, it's like a hammer on our head. I'm not an enjoyer, I'm servant. I'm not an enjoyer, I'm servant. Krishna, Krishna, Hari, Hari. I'm not an enjoyer, I'm servant. Get it through your head. Hari, Ram, Hari, Ram, 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 Hari. Servant, servant, servant. Not enjoyer. Now, Prabhupada said, I said, one of the meanings of the Maha Mantra is, Krishna, for so long I've served Maya. Now I want to serve you. You are the real master. I've served the master Maya. So why do we serve Maya? Because we think Maya has something that we can enjoy. And another thing, which is really important, I don't know if I've spoken about this before, but it's really important, especially Bhakti Nir distributes books, right? Don't you? or any of you who distribute books, or any of you who in any way help people become Krishna conscious, that how can you help somebody? How do you best help somebody? You think about a person's welfare. And how do you think about a person's welfare? Because you're not thinking about your welfare. Or you are thinking about your welfare, but you know if you really want to help them, you have to stop thinking about your welfare. So trying to help them also forces you to stop thinking about your welfare. But in either case, whether you stop thinking about your welfare to help them, or you start helping them and realize you have to stop thinking about yourself to help them, in either case, you see that to really help people, you have to stop thinking about, am I happy, am I not happy? Am I going to enjoy this, am I not going to enjoy this? 
Prabhu, we, we want you to do this service to help these people become Krishna conscious. Will I enjoy it? And we start thinking, will I enjoy it? I don't know if I'll enjoy this. I don't know. Maybe this is not going to make me happy. And, and what do we always find out? We always find out that if we just try to help other people become Krishna conscious, it makes us very happy. It actually, make, it actually makes us a lot happier than anything else we tried to make us happy. Now, the other one was it last Saturday. I gave a class in Mayapur. And if you go to Mayapur TV and then go through their archives and type in my name, you might be able to find it. And we talked a little bit about this in the class. How something very interesting is very important for us to understand. I mean, really important. If you get, if you get this, this can help you tremendously. That Krishna... What is, I mean, it's really important to understand Krishna's position. I mean, what, what is like, what is his reason de etre? Why does Krishna exist, of course? He always exists. You say, well, he exists to create and control. No. That he does through his expansions. You, you know, Krishna in Vrindavan doesn't have an office. He's not on the phone with Brahma. Is everything going okay? Brahma. Is the universe okay? What about the next creation? Are we on schedule? You know, have you paid all the workers? No, he, you don't see him doing that. He expands himself into different forms, and they do that. So what do you see Krishna doing? You see Krishna doing what he likes to do most. And what does Krishna like to do most? He likes to exchange feelings of love. He likes to give happiness to his devotees. That's what he does. And if you, if you just understand this, when you read Krishna's pastimes, you'll see that, that all that's going on between, you know, externally it looks like he's killing some big demon, punching him in the face, whatever. Externally it looks like he's stealing butter or he's holding on to the tail of a cow or he's playing tricks to frustrate the gopis. It all, um, it all looks like that. But, but really, what's going on is, is just he's exchanging affection. He's not doing anything that doesn't increase the affection of his devotees. Yeah, he could have killed the demons with a glance. He didn't, you know, they didn't even have to be demons. He could have blocked them from coming to Vrindavan. Well, you know, every time he does that, it increases everyone's affection. So, um, for the happiness of his devotees, exactly. So, 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 understanding that about Krishna, let's keep that in mind. We understand that Krishna, that's what he likes to do. Of course, from our perspective, we may say, well, wait a minute, you know, I don't have much money in the bank, and Krishna's rich, so why don't, why doesn't yes. gold just appear in my safety deposit box? I mean, if Krishna likes to please his devotees, hey, he'll send some gold my way. Not necessarily. That may not be the best thing for you. And so, Krishna, what he wants is a relationship. You know, if you're not materially so happy, that's not the happiness Krishna's giving you. He's giving you happiness to show you that material happiness is totally inconsequential to spiritual happiness. So anyway, so just understanding that Krishna likes to show affection, you know, it doesn't, you know, you, just because you love somebody doesn't mean you have to give them money, you know. You show your affection in so many ways. You have so many friends you show affection with. You go, you do things, you know, you make presents, you get presents for them on their birthday. But it's not like if you have a million dollars in the bank, you go, hey, here, here's half a million. You might, it's not that you wouldn't, you couldn't, but normally that's not, you show your affection in more personal ways and helping them when they're in distress and so forth. Um, yeah, and they, yeah, if you're advanced, Krishna will give you everything because you can use it. But, so let's get the point. The point is, it's the affection. It's not, it's not in external things. It's in, it's in the affection which comes in the form of what we call rasa, relationship, and the bliss of that relationship. So, the point I'm getting at is, and I mentioned this in the class, and if you can watch the class, I think it would um, elucidate, um, edify what we're speaking about here. 
that Krishna has a special kind of rasa for each of us. So rasa means taste. It's a special kind of happiness for holy K, for joy. He's got another kind of happiness. For Leslie, he's got another kind of happiness. For Sudevi, Krishna's got a special kind of happiness just for Sudevi. And another kind of nectar for Pallavi. And for Anna, or Anna, if it's Sanskrit, it's Anna. If it's Russian, it's probably Anna. It's got a special kind of Russian rasa for her and for Krishna and Sushma. She's got a special kind of, Krishna's got a special kind of nectar for you and for me and for Leela Krishna and for Bhakta Nir and Radhe and Lucky. Each one of us gets a special kind of nectar just made for us by Krishna. Now, Krishna's a good cook, right? This nectar is a lot better than anything you could figure out how to make through trying to enjoy your body. Because this nectar goes way beyond enjoying the body, right? So now, try to understand the situation. We have this body, and the body's going beep, 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 beep. Look at this, listen to that, touch this, feed, feed my stomach, taste this, right? Beep, it's going beep, beep all the time. Now, of course, sometimes we have to satisfy the beeps, otherwise it keeps beeping louder, or we can't even exist. Okay, that's one level, that's okay. But as far as satisfying those beeps to achieve happiness, forget it. It doesn't work. Don't even try. What Krishna can give us is a million, zillion, quadrillion times greater than a fraction of what we can give ourselves. So that's the paradox. That we're in this situation where we have the opportunity to satisfy Krishna, which is infinitely a greater uh, service than trying to satisfy our senses alone and will give us infinitely more pleasure. So now, when we understand that, we understand, okay, I've got the equation backwards, I've got it wrong, this is how it works, and if I do this, I allow Krishna to feed me some of that rasa. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're preventing Krishna from feeding it to us. And then we're just trying, we're cooking our own rasa and our own rasa, yeah, it might taste good, but a week later, we're like, eh, it wasn't so good, I'm not satisfied. It's not like that in devotional service. So it's important to understand that. And in the class that I gave in Mayapur last Saturday, Prabhupada said something amazing in the purport. <clears throat> The purport was about Maharaj Pacheni Bahisha. And Narada Muni had told him a story. And he told him the story with the intention of helping Maharaj Pacheni Bahisha become detached and give up family life. Unfortunately, after he heard the story, he didn't become detached. So then Narada Muni said, All right, let me tell you another story. In other words, Narada Muni hadn't given up on him. And in the purport, Prabhupada's making the point that Maharaj Prachini Bharishat didn't get it, so Narada Muni had to keep instructing him. And then Prabhupada said that the spiritual master keeps instructing the disciple until the disciple gets this one point, that there's no happiness in the material world. I thought that was a very interesting statement because what Prabhupada's saying is the spiritual master... He has to continually instruct the disciple that you're not the enjoyer. Krishna's the enjoyer. Maybe you forgot, but Krishna's the enjoyer. You're not the enjoyer. You serve Krishna, you, you know, you won't be happy. You remember that verse of Brahma, Bhuvana, Loka, from Brahma, Loka down? You don't forget that verse because you're not going to be happy here. Things are not permanent. Plans don't work out the way you want them. Sometimes your body hurts. Sometimes people aren't nice to you. Sometimes we get in accidents. You're not going to be really happy here. So the spiritual master is to keep speaking to us, convincing us. And so Prabhupada said, the spiritual master keeps instructing the disciple until he comes to the understanding that he can't be happy through fruitive activities. It's an interesting statement. It's almost like Prabhupada saying, once the disciple understands that, he's good to go now. Okay, fly out of the nest. You know, you don't even need me. The super soul will guide you. 
It's not exactly like that, but partially it's like that. It's like, okay, you know, you're, you're in Nishta now, you're steadied. Once you understand this material world is not a place of enjoyment, you become steady in bhakti. So, very interesting point, if you meditate on it, that's the, the hope the spiritual master is preaching, speaking, speaking, till you get this, get this point. And it's not easy to get. Maharaj Prachini Barishat was with Narada Muni and he didn't get it. So a lot of people were with Prabhupada, they didn't get it. Not everybody gets it. And we're still trying to get it. I'm not the enjoyer, I'm not the enjoyer. Write that down. I'm not the enjoyer, I'm not the enjoyer. 108 times, I'm not the enjoyer. Krishna's the enjoyer. I'm a servant, I'm a servant. I'm not the enjoyer. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Two hours a day we're chanting, we're chanting our rounds. Do we get it? But we're getting it slowly, a little bit. You know, Let's you know, push it up a little more. Uh, Krishna's the enjoyer, enjoyer, enjoyer. Not me, not me, not me. So, Holy K is saying, isn't it true that he appears to a devotee in a way that they see him Friend, brother, yes, um, of course. And um, the purport of this whole thing is Krishna wants to make us happy, so let him do it. Let him do it. He wants to make us happy. Let him make us, let, well, allow him to make you happy. How can you allow him to make you happy? Just let him enjoy. Let him enjoy you. If Krishna enjoys you, you'll be happy. If you try to be, you try to enjoy yourself, you won't be. It's just the way it works. It's just the way the world works. Simple formula. This is how it works. We just have to get it. It's, uh, it doesn't work any other way. And um, here's another thought. A very interesting thought to um, the way the way Krishna does this is that. If we have a concept that um, Krishna, that we can enjoy something, oftentimes what Krishna does is he creates a problem in our life associated to trying to enjoy that. And the reason he does that is because he wants us to, he wants to purify us of the seed that's causing that, in, that propensity to enjoy. So if he frustrates us, in our attempt to enjoy, then, in theory, a little light will go off in our head and say, hmm, I tried to enjoy this, it didn't work. Of course, the problem is, what we normally think is, try to enjoy this, I must have done it the wrong way, or maybe I had the wrong attitude, so let me try it a different way. That's the mode of passion, or just let's keep going. A lot of ignorance is, well, let's just drink alcohol and we'll forget uh, that it was miserable. And and mode of goodness would be, okay, this didn't work. Why? Because I was in the mode of passion, it didn't work. Because I didn't do things right, it didn't work. Because I was irreligious, I was impious, it was sinful. Because I didn't put myself subordinate to God. That's the mode of goodness. So that's, that's what Krishna's doing. So I try, you know... I try, even even problems that I have in my life, just with other people, and you go, oh, this person is so this or that. You know, why not think think in your own heart and say, I have this propensity to control. Whenever that propensity goes, gets out of hand, I have problems in relationships. Why not think like that? That the problem is because of my desire to enjoy and control. And Krishna's trying to purify me of that desire. Why not think like that? That's actually what's happening. Whenever there is this, this tension in relationships, it's, it's really Krishna's really trying to purify us. And that's why he does it. And if you look at every difficulty in your life, go back and say, okay, do I have a, the wrong attitude? Am I, thinking, am I thinking I can enjoy this? And that's why Krishna just sent this person who was so nasty to me just to show me that you, know, you think you can enjoy being in charge or being in control or enjoying this person. Look at how they treated you. You know, <laughs> or you want to be honored, right? And you do something to be honored, and the guy next to you gets all the honor. And you didn't have to think. See, Krishna's showing me that I'm because I have this desire. I'm just suffering, and I should give it up. Um, yes, no. So, so Sushma is saying, 
Okay, let's go back. Um, I have to go back. Uh, then I'll get to your question, Sushma. So basically, he will cause problems sometimes by giving you trouble enjoying something material. If, if you have a strong attachment to it or, or tendency to enjoy it in a way that's detrimental to your bhakti, then he'll, he'll cause frustration in your life trying to enjoy that. It just, it's very, it's very, um, very prominent in, in household life. You know, when a husband's trying to enjoy the wife, the wife's trying to enjoy the husband, then it doesn't work, and then there's frustration, and then the smart body will think, no, oh, because Krishna's showing me, listen, you're trying to enjoy this person, and this is the result. It just ended up in distress. Whereas if you try to serve them, then you'll be happy. I mean, really, ladies, if you, will, you, will your husband be happy if you just try to serve him? Please him, make him happy? Of course. And guys, will your wife be happy if you just see to her pleasure, see that she's satisfied, see that she has what she needs and you show her a lot of affection? Guaranteed, it works. Whereas you think, I'm the enjoyer, and you tell your wife, do, do this, do that, I don't care how you feel. It's just, you know, she's not going to be happy. If she's not happy, you're not going to be happy. So that's an example where Krishna is, is, is showing us that, okay, you have this tendency to enjoy, but if you don't curb it and you, you exploit it, you're just going to keep suffering. And I'm going to bring you suffering because I want you to realize to give up that tendency to enjoy this thing. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so let's go. Um, um, yeah, so he'll. It's it's if he causes problems, it's only it's only a lesson to show us. No, this causes problems. Now, you'll see that the more you purify yourself of your desire to enjoy, the less those problems will come because you you don't need them because you're not thinking. You're not thinking, I can enjoy this. And obviously because you're not thinking you can enjoy it, you're not trying to enjoy it. So now there's no suffering because you haven't even started the process of suffering. So the more we, we become free from the desire to enjoy, the more we become free from suffering. And all, you know, all this karma that is slowly reducing within us, if there's any karma there that's manifesting, is this Krishna's manifesting it because there's some propensity to think, oh, you know, I can enjoy, yeah, I'm the big enjoyer. And then, boom, we get very sick. No, no, it becomes obvious when you're sick, you're not the big enjoyer. But what becomes obvious is you're the big sufferer. And so that's what Krishna's telling us in the Bhagavad Gita, that we're the big sufferer. But sometimes he has to create a little suffering to make us realize that. Just like this boy I was saying, he was, you know, he was upset about his girlfriend leaving him. And I was saying, well, you know, you have to realize that when we try to enjoy these relationships in the wrong consciousness, this is, it, can, it can turn into all kinds of suffering. You know, so so the, the message is, just be the servant. And I told him something which was difficult for him. I said, be happy that she has another man that she likes more than you. Difficult, right? But if you're Krishna conscious, you can actually do that because you're not the enjoyer. And so you're happy if other people enjoy. You're happy if Krishna enjoys. And if you're Sisupal, you can't stand it that Krishna enjoys. You know, Sisupal, when he was a baby, before he could even talk, he was talking about it. He was forming words about how much he hated Krishna. So Sisupal is kind of the extreme, you know, when you want to become an enjoyer, the extreme of that is you just turn against God. You know, so you have atheism, they're just turned against God. You have Maya bodies trying to be God. And you have Sishupal and the like, who just want to kill him. Or scientists, you know, they want to kill God through theories. Sishupal just wanted to kill God with any way he could. Kamsa wanted to kill him. So, you know, if you can kill God, you can take his position. I don't advise it. But that's the mentality. So, um, let's go on with your questions. Then, 
ends nimzu says so basically he will cause problems sometimes by giving you trouble enjoying something material yeah and if that happens then just reflect what why did Krishna cause me the problem what propensity did I have inside do I have inside that he's trying to curb so I don't do this again and run into this problem he can get you to realize it's not that fun to enjoy yes if you haven't realized it yet I mean the problem is we have realized it it's just it doesn't sink in so deeply and and one way it sinks in more deeply is if you just are happy in Krishna consciousness and then you realize that that Krishna consciousness is a lot better, it's a lot more fun, there's a lot more happiness, it's a lot more enjoyment than anything you can get material. I mean, I'm living in Mayapur, I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm, I'm living high on the hog. Or maybe we should say high on the cow, or high on the dam. I'm, living, I'm enjoying it. What am I enjoying? Sadhu Sangha, there's like a thousand devotees here. Um, seeing Radha Madhava every morning. Hearing amazing classes every day, wonderful kirtans. Yeah, I'm enjoying it all, but I don't think I'm the enjoyer. So yes, enjoy Krishna consciousness. Um, so, so, and Nimzu says that I've helped her. So now Krishna, maybe he'll show some mercy on me for helping a devotee. Um, Attachment to laptop and Facebook. Yeah. You just have to use it for Krishna. But, you know, Facebook can be a very excellent way to waste time that could be utilized um, in more productive ways. So, my attachment to lust I'm battling with. Yeah. Um, there. The whole The whole thing is and Nim and Nimzu, the whole thing is that, that really, really, truly, when it gets down to it, if you if you study our philosophy carefully, our philosophy teaches that you can be self controlled through use of your intelligence. And that's how we became devotees. We just said, Wow, this is so true. But it can't sustain it just by use of your intelligence, just by knowing can't sustain it. It has to be experienced. So through bhakti you can experience Krishna's mercy, Krishna's love, the bliss of Krishna consciousness. And ultimately it's only through that bliss that you will really be able to give up anything. Permanently. So you may give up some things because you know you should give them up and so you force yourself and you're a very determined person and a very sense-controlled person and you do it and you live more in the mode of goodness and in the mode of goodness you can be more self-disciplined. But ultimately, it's not going to sustain itself unless it comes to the transcendental position where you're actually experiencing the bliss of Krishna consciousness. You know, you're relishing your japa, you're relishing the sangha, you're relishing hearing Bhagavatam. You, just, you like to serve Krishna, it's inspiring. Then these other things in comparison, are insignificant. Even big things. That's very interesting. I'll tell you a story. Which I, I always find this story interesting. There was a Sankirtan party of brahmacharis, of many brahmacharis. There were six Greyhound buses and many vans. And they traveled around America. So you're talking hundreds. And each bus was a temple. And they did Harinam at the colleges and book distribution all over America. So they had, some of them or all of them had the opportunity to speak to Prabhupada. And one of them asked Prabhupada, he said, we're going out on book distribution. And, you know, these were all young men in their early 20s. And during the week, during the day, book distribution, or, or during the evening also, was done in in front of stores, grocery stores, and um, like your Walmarts, Kmarts, they had so many stores. They didn't have all the stores they have today, but stores like that, and they would stand out in front of the stores, or they'd go around the parking lot. And during the week, the majority of people who shop at the stores are women. So it meant that these young men were distributing books or collecting donations primarily from women. And so for some of them, it was a little disturbing after a while. That all day they're talking to women. So they asked Prabhupada about it and how to deal with it. Prabhupada said, it's just a little itch, tolerate it. 
That's basically all he said. In other words, what was Prabhupada saying? What was he doing? He was, he was taking something that for the brahmacharis they felt was a huge problem. And even they could back it up philosophically, saying that is the problem in the material world. It is a physical attraction between man and woman. That's the problem. And then presenting it to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada just blowing it off. It was just an itch. Don't scratch it. Any other questions? He said, like, why did Prabhupada say that? Well, he said it because that's how he sees it himself. Because he's in Krishna consciousness. And, and from the Krishna conscious point of view, it's just an itch. What's the big thing? Don't scratch it. And also because we, we take these material attachments to be like these really huge things. Oh no, this is so big. And Prabhupada's looking at it and go and say, compared to Krishna consciousness, that's insignificant. Don't, don't think that it's a big thing. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. It's nothing. It's just, it's just a cigarette or just a cup of coffee or it's just a beer or it's just a desire to control. It's, just, it's all nothing compared to, to the nectar of your relationship with Krishna. It's nothing compared to what Krishna can give you. I mean, what is that little itch compared to the rasa that Krishna can give you, the ecstasy, the love, um, is, there's no comparison. So, we have to look at it that way. But ultimately, we have to allow ourselves to experience it. And by experiencing it, then we'll also look at what we used to be attached to and say, that's insignificant. That is nothing. I can't believe that I thought that was pleasure. That's a stage we want to come to. And we won't come to it unless we experience it in Krishna consciousness, and we won't fully experience it unless we put ourselves in the mood of enjoyed, and Krishna is the enjoyer, and we follow some regulated sadhana bhakti that allows us, that allows Krishna to be able to shower his nectar on us, to become worthy recipients of his nectar. Um, yeah, so... So, and Nimzu says, I, and Nimzu's other name is Holy K. No, it's actually Holy, yeah, it's Holy, well, it's Holly K. But I renamed her to Holy K. We haven't figured out what the K stands for, yes, but we think it's Holy Krishna Dasi. Right? Sounds good. Okay. Thank Krishna for helping me make things unpleasant. Yeah, if, if something's unpleasant, we should always think, okay, Krishna, you're doing this for a reason because you love me. And let me just understand why you're doing this. I think it was the Dalai Lama, somebody said, it's a good thing God doesn't fulfill all our desires. So I think we can, you know, we can think that way. Wow, what if he actually fulfilled my desires? <laughs> all my desires. I mean, like, I mean, look at it. Okay, let's say... Let's say right now, you know, you're looking at your life, you're looking at how hard you're working, looking at what you're doing. And, and then I said, hey, no problem. If you want, I'll support you. You don't have to work. You can just take it easy. I'll just, just send me your bills. I'll pay for all of them. So let's say you did that. How would your life change? You think you'd be more Krishna conscious or less? Think about it. I mean, because in the back of our mind, we're looking, oh, I have to make money, I have to work, I have to do this and that. I just would like to serve Krishna all day. Now, some of you actually might actually engage in Krishna's consciousness all day if you didn't have to work. Some of you might not. Now what if I upped the ante and said, not only will I pay for everything, but on top of that, $5,000 spending money. Would you buy $5,000 worth of books to distribute or would you buy a 68-inch flat-screen TV, the latest MacBook Pro? You know, you have to ask yourself these questions. And when you if you realize that you probably would get a little lazy and fill your house with stuff you didn't need, then that might explain why right now you're practically broke. Because Krishna, I mean, there may be other reasons you're broke, if you are, but or you don't have all the money you want, then that might explain it. Krishna might just be saying, no, you're not ready for it. And when you're ready, he'll, he can give you more. Now, what often Krishna does is he fulfills your desire. So let's say, you know, I really want more money, this and that, the nice house, the nice car. 
when you come to a point where you're detached and you really don't really want it anymore, that's usually when Krishna gives it. He says, okay, now I'll give it to you because I know now you don't really care anymore. So I know you want it. It was like Dhruva Maharaj, you know, Krishna appeared. And Dhruva said, oh my God, I was, you were like a diamond and I, you know, my desires were like pieces of glass. So I don't even care. Krishna said, no, I know you wanted it, so I'm going to give it to you. No, 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 I don't want to take it. I don't want to bother you. I don't need it. No, no, I'll give it to you. So Krishna sometimes is like that. When you finally give up your desire, then he says, okay, I always knew you wanted this, so okay, here it is. But now you can handle it because you don't even want it anymore. So now you're, you're living in the big house on the sea and... Uh, you're just bringing people to the nice house because they all want to go there because it's a nice place and they're, you're preaching Krishna consciousness to them and everything's great. So see it that way. Um, yeah, and I give up things to make Krishna happy. Uh, okay, let's go back a little further. Um, helping me make things unpleasant to help me break a bad attachment, yes. Susma says, in trouble we need him most and we feel close to him. Yeah, it make you more dependent, you think of him more. If you, if you go on to mahatmawisdom.com, then I posted this, um, I don't know where it is, it's, I think it's under the heading of special writings or realizations. Uh, mahatmawisdom.com and there's a thing, um, something I wrote called My Conversation with Krishna or My Conversation with God and it expresses this that, that sometimes Krishna makes things uncomfortable so we'll move forward and more dependent I give up things to make Krishna happy Yeah, you know, so you're attached to something if you can't use it, you can't dovetail it it has no place in devotional service then you give it up if you can use it, okay you can you want a nice house a nice car, cool. You know you can use that in Krishna service. You get I, I said the other week I said this devotee he bought a Mercedes Benz and he uses it. Why did he buy it? So he picks up all the devotees at the airport, all the you know VIPs that come. Now they have they can ride in a Mercedes, so he could afford it and he did it. And that's what he wanted to do. Okay. But the cigarette, you can't really use in Krishna's service. The Mercedes, you can use. The big house, you can use. The silk sari, you can use. The bottle of beer, I don't know. If you, get, if you use the bottle of beer to get other people to stop drinking somehow or other, yeah, by knocking it on their head or whatever, yeah, then you could, then it'll work. But, but otherwise, it's, some things are not engageable. And practically everything's engageable, but some things are not directly engageable is that a word engageable it is now if it's not it is now okay um, Ka- and and Nimzu says Catherine I would like to have a more Krishna conscious name you can someday it's possible Four, follow the four regative principles and chant 16 rounds every day. And you can take initiation and then you'll get a name. That's something that's a name, something like Holy Krishna Dasi. Holy, what's the Sanskrit for holy? Who knows the Sanskrit for holy? The yeah, Shuddha. Shuddha means pure. I don't know if that's a name, Shuddha Krishna. Anyway, we'll worry about that later. Um, Sushma's saying, it's so difficult to enjoy material life. You have to please so many people. <laughs> I don't think anybody can be happy. Yeah, Prabhupada mentions that <laughs> in, the, in the Bhagavatam. Yeah? Trying to please people that you know you can't be perfectly pleased. Yeah, it is, it, Trying to be happy in the material world, it's a lot of work. It's like you're digging for gold, and all you find is gold dust. You never actually get the, you know, find a little speck of gold dust here that you don't really find it. So you know, it's like digging for happiness in the material world. It's a lot of work, and you don't get much back. So I advise not to dig. I advise you just um, become the enjoyed, 
And as um, soon as you give up trying to enjoy, that moment you'll enjoy. That was the instruction of Prahlad Maharaj. He said, how do you become happy? Here's a secret, don't try. Because as soon as you try, you don't know how to do it, it cause your unhappiness. You know from experience, you ever try to do something that you don't know how to do? What happens? What happens is, you mess it up. So, smart thing is, if you don't know how to do it, don't try it. This is my father, you know, I've been trying to fix something, and if I'd be forcing it, he'd always say, don't force it. Because usually it meant, if you're forcing it, it's not meant to be forced, and you're probably just going to turn it the wrong way and then break the handle off. Because the handle was meant to go the other way, or the handle's stuck in some way, and it just putting more pressure on it is not what it needs. It needs some oil or something. So, it's kind of like that, you know, if you're, don't force it. So like material happiness, don't force it, because it's just, do it in a dharmic way, then to be pious, then, then you'll be happy, right? Um, so, so, very good point, Sushma, Pallavi, if Krishna would fulfill my desires, my life would be in chaos. Wow, make a t-shirt out of that one, that's a good one. Krishna would fulfill all my desires, my life would be not a chaos, in chaos. Make a poster. Send it to all your friends. Yeah, that's the truth. Now, the problem is, Paul, you have to change your desires. Now, now, if you're a pure devotee and Krishna fulfills all your desires, the whole world would be out of chaos. So that's the second part of the teaching. My conditioned state of Krishna fulfills all my desires. My life and my life would be in chaos. In my pure state of Krishna fulfills my desires, I'd get the whole world out of chaos. Right. So, Holy K says, with five thousand dollars, I would build a mini temple in Vaishnava clothes. You mean you'd buy a lot of Vaishnava clothes? Yeah, you'd have a good wardrobe. Yes. Why not? And so. So, Holy K, you can think, oh, Krishna, how do I get this money? I want to have a little temple here. That's fine. You could be thinking, Krishna, I want a million dollars. I want ten million, a zillion. It doesn't matter. If your desire is pure, think big. Don't keep it small. So the whole thing is, um, sometimes we minimize our desire because we think, oh, that'll be maya. No. If you can use it for Krishna, think big. Think the world. Krishna, send the world. I'm ready. I want to give the world back to you. It belongs to you. I don't, you know, I'll just have a little, be like Chanaka Pandit. You know, I'll get the world. Chanaka's in the kingdom and he lives in a little hut and he's basically running the whole kingdom through the king. And Maharaj Chandragupta is like conquering all over India. He practically controlled all of India under the guidance of Chanaka Pandit. And Chanaka is a Brahmin living in a little thatched hut or something. But really it's Chanaka that's really responsible for Maharaj Chandragupta's Success. So Krishna, let's take the world back for you. And, you know, I can live simply. Prabhupada lived simply. I mean, there were a lot of nice buildings he lived in, but he didn't stay for more than a few days to enjoy them. So everything for Krishna. Prabhupada's motto, everything for Krishna, nothing for me. So, um, a nice deity with all these things I need to take care of of it after initiation. Yeah, well, that's second initiation. First you get, first initiation, you don't get Gayatri Mantra generally. And then, after first initiation, we want to see if you are steady. That you're able to follow the principles, steadily chant your rounds, do devotional service. And then, when we see, okay, you're actually in Satvagu and Brahminical, you have a Brahminical nature and you can maintain it, then you get second initiation. And then you can actually do deity worship in the temples. Uh, okay, so I think it's time to end. <clears throat> the hour classes have been now going an hour and a half. By all the questions, we read, um, I think, a half a page, three quarters of a page. Anyway, at this rate, it'll take us 14 lifetimes to get through the Jaiva Dharma. But all your questions are good questions and relevant to your lives and also, I believe, relevant to the topic. 
So uh, next week we will be here again. We will see you. And thank you all for coming. And a big Hare Krishna to all of you.